I'm afraid of flying. I said it there. I feel like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders, but it's true. I am so scared each and every time I step on an airplane. Now, that might seem random for me to start off a video with, and especially random considering how much travel I actually do in my day-to-day -day life. People who know me or follow my work either on Instagram or here on YouTube know that we travel a lot, right? For business, for personal reasons. Like, we are constantly on the go traveling across the country, traveling around the world, and it's not like I'm taking a steamboat to get there. So, what's the deal? Well, the truth is, I fly a lot, but I hate flying. I hate it so much. I am so scared every time I step on a plane. But in order to understand why I'm afraid of flying, and um, quite honestly, why I'm choosing to tell this story now of all times, feels really random, we, we have to rewind back to 2006. And I know that sounds like a long time ago, but don't worry, we'll be back to present day soon enough. It's, there's a point to all this, I just, need to start there. Put yourself in the mindset of not having an iPhone or an Android, but instead having a Motorola Razr. And, you know, Sonic 06 was new and people were excited about it. You poor simple fools. So in the summer of 2006, I was fortunate enough to get to do a study abroad program for theater in London. And it was no exaggeration, one of the coolest experiences of my life. As a teenager, I ate, slept, and jazz-handed theater all day, every day. And so to do nothing but two months of theater in a foreign country, watching plays every night, and then getting to spend the rest of the time with some of my best friends in a foreign country, it was awesome. I was broke all through college in America. And at the time, I remember the conversion rate of the British pound to the US dollar was $2 for every one pound, which made me doubly broke in the UK. Uh, it meant that all my lunches were razor thin slice of peanut butter on top of like a crumpet that I got from like the local Tesco. Let's just say that I lost a lot of weight <laughs> during that summer. Did it mean that I missed out on the local cuisine? Yes, but also if you know British cuisine, did I really miss out on all that much? D don't get me wrong, UK. I love your theater, I love your public transit system, and I love the fact that you gave us Harry Potter, but let's be serious. A man can only have so many mushy peas in his life. Anyway, long story short, the program was amazing. I left loving theater even more than I already did, and I made friends and memories that would last a lifetime. I just didn't want to leave. And then, the day the program ended, something happened that made me really not want to leave. I'll never forget it. I remember exactly where I stood. The program director gathered us all together, pulled us aside, and he let us know that the previous night it had been discovered that there was a terrorist plot, that local authorities had found a group of terrorists who were planning on attacking planes set to fly from the UK back to the US on the same day that we were set to return from the UK to the US. In case you don't remember that particular terrorist plot, you know why you're not able to carry water bottles or large bottles of contact solution onto planes? It was this, this 2006 foiled terrorist plot. This wasn't just a plot to bring down one or two airliners. At least seven, perhaps more, would have been blown out of the sky on a single day. These were the men prepared to launch those attacks using liquid bombs. The plan was for them to smuggle explosives in liquid containers, water bottles, uh, I think Tang was actually the biggest one that they were going to use, which in and of itself should have been a primary indicator there. Big red flag, my friends. Who's drinking Tang? Luckily, the authorities had found it out before anyone got hurt, but I mean, that was the day that we were set to fly out on planes that we were flying out on. How do you know, right? How do you know that they got everyone? How do you know that there wasn't some backup plan or that the liquids were the only thing that they were planning on using? And it's not like there was anything I could do to avoid flying on that day, right? Like the dorms had been shut down. Flights were getting delayed all over the place. And I told you we were dirt poor. I wasn't going to be able to afford a last minute international flight change. And so you just had to board through the massive delays, through the three hours, four hours of security lines. Like it was insane. I remember calling my folks before getting on the plane to let them know that we were finally boarding and that there was going to be massive delays and that I loved them. Because I wasn't sure what would happen 
during that seven and a half hour flight on the way back. It was a seven and a half hour overnight flight and yet I did not sleep a wink. I was hyper alert the entire time watching everything. Every hour on the hour, I remember I would go to the bathroom and open up all the different drawers and compartments where they store extra toilet paper and like ladies sanitary things and even dig through the garbage just because I was convinced that if someone was going to assemble a bomb on a plane, that would be where it was hidden. And so I would dig through and see if there was anything suspicious. There were suspicious things in the garbage can, but uh, not anything that was particularly dangerous. From my seat, I would just be upright and I was watching everyone as they would get up and pull things out of the like overhead compartment or pull things out of their bag thinking, what is it? Are they getting up too many times? What are they pulling out? Is it something that could be dangerous? It occurs to me now, like, what is it, 14 years later, it occurs to me now that I was probably the most suspicious person on that plane with my like weird routines going to the bathroom, me like looking around constantly. But yeah, that's, I mean, that is how my brain coped with it. I mean, let me be clear. I feel guilty that I suspected literally everyone else on the plane, but I mean, what was I gonna do, right? In my mind, this was life or death. And if there was anything that I could have done in that situation to help protect myself and everyone else on that plane, well, I was gonna do it. Even if that meant suspecting everyone, even if it meant some oddly extended trips to the bathroom. I mean, what are a couple hours of lost sleep for the opportunity to land safely and keep your life? That's exactly what happened, right? It was a completely non-eventful flight, nothing happened, and I went to my normal, everyday existence. Except with one delightful new feature, a crippling anxiety about flying. On some levels, I think it makes sense that I was terrified on that flight, right? I mean, the coincidence of having a terrorist plot happening on the same day that you are set to fly, and not only that, but also on the same flights that you're supposed to take, yeah, that's gonna make someone pretty darn jumpy. The problem was, it wasn't just limited to that one flight. After that day, I was so terrified to step on any plane ever. It was literally days, if not weeks in advance that I would start feeling the anxiety building up in me and I would do things like researching weather conditions, researching the make and model of the plane to make sure it didn't have a significant crash history, looking on turbulenceforecast.com, great website by the way, it's still one of my most visited on my phone, to make sure that I understood weather patterns that were happening that day and see how much turbulence I would expect for that individual flight. Even stuff as crazy as making sure to plan my travel and my vacations around days that didn't have some sort of like number significance, right? Like not national holidays, not the anniversary, anniversary of 9-11 or some big dictator's birthday or whatever. Even stuff like avoid the lucky number sevens, 777, or avoid the crazy eights, like 080808. What if you take the day and the month and you multiply them and you get the year? Well, that is outright, I mean, ridiculous stuff like this. And I know that by telling you this, I, I am making myself sound like a crazy person, but this is what I was going through. I mean, flight attendants would come by my seat and stop and ask if I was okay or if I needed like a nausea bag because of how pale and bleary-eyed I was on some of these flights. It got to the point where Stephanie had to tell the flight attendants in advance that I was a nervous flyer so that way they wouldn't get suspicious of me. Or I would be stuck in a foreign country because she didn't get me to go on a plane. There was one instance where we were leaving Amsterdam and it was a flight to get to Italy. And I, I swear, if it hadn't been for Stephanie actually convincing me to get on that flight, I would still be in Amsterdam right now. For a while, I thought that my phobia of flying was tied to the 2006 thing, obviously, but also to my memories of September 11th. Uh, I was 14 at the time, a freshman in high school, and I remember that morning. I remember joking with my friends, actually, when the news first broke, because we didn't understand it. We didn't, it, it, it didn't process, right? We had just heard it through like some other people talking about it, but then you saw the footage and you saw the planes entering the buildings and you saw the loss of life that came with it and the wreckage. And that's when a switch flipped like that. Suddenly this, this world that just kind of exists, you're blissfully ignorant of it when you're in high school, right? Or at least you used to be. This was the days before internet were really prevalent. And so like, it just existed out there, right? You, your world was high school. Your world were like your extracurriculars and whether or not you got on the swim team or whatever. But suddenly with September 11th, that bubble popped. 
it just went away and all of a sudden the world comes crashing in literally and figuratively and it's no longer a safe space it's no longer this blissfully ignorant area suddenly the world is chaotic and threatening and scary and the thing is i love math and science and statistics Big shocker there, and so of course I was able to logic my way through knowing that, yeah, my chances of getting injured in an airplane are like one in three million. But I just couldn't logic my way out of that fear of flying. The best that I could do was all that research leading up to the flight, which made me at least feel like I had done some semblance of controlling for all the variables. And you see, that's the operative word here. Control me with my head on a swivel watching everyone and in the bathroom digging through the trash. It was me trying to control the situation when in reality I was powerless to prevent any sort of accident. In the future flights, it, again, all that research, all that looking into the variables around that flight, more me trying to control every element that I possibly could when, let's be honest, what was it really doing? Nothing. Just feeding into my anxiety. Even back when I was in school, I was totally that kid, right? I would memorize everything that was on the study guide because then I would be able to answer everything right and thus control the grade that I got. And then my brain would get that little shot of dopamine saying, you did good, kid, and I'd be like, yay, yay for me. Now, what does any of this have to do with the channel? Why am I telling you this story now? Well, it's been on my mind a lot as we've been trapped in quarantine because if there's one thing 2020 has been about, it's about a lack of control. In the aftermath of that 2006 thing, I had this fantasy, this, this complete pie-in-the-sky goal to be rich and successful enough that I could actually buy a plane. And I wouldn't be buying it to be fancy or for the luxury of it or for the flex or anything like that. I'm not a Jake Paul or anything like that. I, I, I wanted it so I could feel safe finally on a plane so I could be in control because if you own the plane you've chosen the make and model you've chosen the pilot or heck maybe you're even the pilot yourself you know each and every person who is on that plane because you're the one who created the guest list and then 2020 happened and reality shattered that fantasy specifically January 26 that was the day when the news broke that star basketball player Kobe Bryant had died along with his daughter in a tragic helicopter accident. A private helicopter accident. I was heartbroken. Not because I'm some big basketball fan, but because the story was tragic. Because here was a guy who had it all, right? He had it all. He had youth and he had good looks and he was talented beyond belief and he had money and success and fame and a beautiful family. And he was just a nice guy to boot as opposed to a lot of other celebrities. He was just a caring and compassionate guy by all accounts of anyone who knew him. If there was someone who had the means to control every element of his life, it was him. And what? It can all be taken away in... I wanted to do this video back then, in the aftermath of that event, because it was just something I was thinking about a lot, you know? And I wanted to get those feelings out on the channel to, to talk to you guys about. But then 2020 hit again. Found a new way to show that you are still out of control. I'm obviously talking about coronavirus. Now, it isn't just about a flight here or there. Suddenly, everything is a threat. We were, and still are, being forced to deal with a threat that could be anywhere, on anything because it's invisible. I mean, it is like the worst game of prop hunt ever. <laughs> a really reductive way of looking at it, but it's actually kind of true. It sucks, right? And sure, you wash your hands, you wear your mask, you hunker down, you quarantine yourself, you do your best to control the situation as much as you can. But again, just like on a plane, there's only so much you can do. At a certain point, even the most prepared of us, even the most controlling of us can have Instead of a tragic accident, we can have ourselves a tragic diagnosis. There's 2020 hammering that point home yet again. The thing is, what I've learned and what I'm still learning is that whether it's terrorists on planes or worldwide pandemics or, heck, normal everyday fears like 
failing a test or trying out for the school play or asking the girl out and she rejects you, like whatever, you know, the normal everyday mundane fears that we used to have before all this craziness hit, the fact is we can't let fear control our lives. The need that I had to control everything around me when it came to flights was quite frankly unrealistic and in some cases even downright self-destructive as I missed out on opportunities that were presented to me. It was only once I started to force myself onto planes again, uh, more accurately, Stephanie physically forcing me onto planes again, that my fear of flying actually got better. I mean, I still get nervous, but not nearly to the extent that I was getting scared, but that's only after 20, 30 flights after that 2006 experience. And the thing is, that's actually scientifically proven. The single most effective treatment for phobias is exposure therapy. It actually has been shown to alter brain chemistry so that way the body starts to understand that there's nothing to be afraid of here, that I can actually handle this, that the fear that I have is unfounded. Now, don't get me wrong, I am far from calm when the plane shakes in the air, and I am still a frequent user of TurbulenceForecast.com, like I mentioned before, but the thing is, I'm a lot better. I am so, so much better. When I learned to let go of that need for complete control, I was able to finally grow past that point in my life. That control that I wanted so badly, it was all an illusion. It was a lie. It wasn't real. You can do your best to try and shape the world into exactly what you want it to be, but at a certain point, the world just pushes back. It's not going to cooperate. And so at those points, it comes down to a choice. Are you actually going to choose to let fear dictate how you live your life, or are you actually going to live by acknowledging the fear, accepting it, and then moving through it? Because that's the thing. Fear is fine, it is normal, it is healthy to be afraid. But once that fear starts controlling your life to a crippling degree, that's when it becomes dangerous. That's when it becomes destructive because it's your life. You need to live it and you can't sacrifice opportunities for yourself because of some vague fear. I think the moral of this whole story is coronavirus is gonna end. One of these days, someday soon probably, we'll get the all clear from officials and then probably a week later we'll get the all clear from the people who actually know what they're talking about, saying you can go outside, normal life is open up to you again. And I'm afraid that we're gonna be too anxious, too scared to accept that. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying break quarantine early or, or go to the park or walk down to the bodega to get a burrito with a hundred of your closest friends. No, I'm, we need to give this the time that it takes to solve, but I'm saying, when we are past that point where we are in the safe zone, we need to accept normalcy again. We have to say, yes, I'm okay getting back to my normal life. Because if we don't, then what was this all for? What were the months of quarantine for? What were the people who were on the front lines of this thing, the doctors and nurses, what were they fighting for? They were fighting for us to be able to get back to our normal lives, to get back to a place where we're not governed by fear anymore. We're not constantly worried about some invisible threat around us all the time. But if we don't allow ourselves to get past that anxiety, if we don't go out and face that fear head on, all of that, all of those months of sacrifice are wasted. It's all thrown away. The world is out there waiting, and we didn't fight this hard and wait this long to just let fear corrupt it or ruin it for us. And that's fear of a virus, that's fear of failure, and that's even fear of an airplane every now and then. Except for skydiving. Not doing that. No, you can absolutely let fear dictate your inability to do that one, because that's just stupid. Jumping out of a plane, why would you do that? That's Nope. Anyway, that's me wrapping things up here. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for letting me get this psychological baggage off my chest. I've been thinking about a lot of this maybe too much lately, uh, and I just needed to get it off my chest. But uh, thank you for being there. I hope it was interesting to you. I hope you found it helpful, maybe, to some of you out there. We're getting through this together. And remember, that's just a chat. A mat chat. Stay safe. See you on the other side.